to hear the story from Bangladesh and what happens in Bangladesh, but we're also here in a way to celebrate our solidarity with each other as human beings. And so I want to uh, welcome uh, Kalpona up here to the stand to talk to, to the podium to talk to you tonight and to uh, tell us about her struggle and her amazing job and thank you so much. Come on up here. I'm sure that I start at 6.15, okay? <laughs> Thank you so much for coming here. I mean, after a long day, I know you had a long discussion today, but we did some good protest at the Harsan Bay, I guess, in the same time. So, good evening, everyone. I really thank uh, BC Federation of Labor for inviting me in here. It is so important I know many of you know definitely what is happening in Bangladesh, but you know, talking to union people and other who really care about the workers in person, it is so, so important. I know you're reading them in the newspaper, maybe in the television, but you know, if you hear someone talk to you in front of and telling what's happening there, I think it is more connect. So, as, I, as Jim said, yes, my name is Kalpana Akhtar, and I'm from Bangladesh. So, I, work, I, I started work at 12 with my brother, who was 10 years old. And of course, it wasn't my choice to go to the factory when I went to the school previous day. It was because my dad, who was sick, and he couldn't bring food in the table for us. And my mom, she started, but she was making very little amount of money, maybe $3 for per month. And definitely that is not enough for seven person in the family. So if my mom would pay more, maybe I would not do go to school. But it's better I didn't. So I would not able to see you people rock the world and bring the voice from the ground. Okay, so yes, so me and my brother started working and it is not only just two of us at the factory in that age, definitely there are many other child workers working at the factory in these day, in that days. How it was look like working in that age? How was the working condition? It was 14 to 16 hours shift was common. Even I worked 23 days in a row. I was forced to be at the factory and keep doing my work. And I was making only six to six, you know, six, uh, dollars or 50 cents see, working 450 hours in a month. Yes, it is shame. But I couldn't say that in that age because I didn't know there is a law and rights that can protect me. And then we went for a strike when the factory owner decided to pay us less for our overtime, what we used to get. And though we don't know the law, but one thing we figured, this is not done. You cannot do that. We went to strike, we owned the strike, but the resolution was 20 of my coworkers, they got fired. And they were looking for an organization where they can find someone to help them to sue the factory owners and fight back and they found someone, some organization. It's AFL-CIO from US. They have their international wing in Bangladesh called Solidarity Center. They were helping group of uh, workers to have their own independent union. 
where I went to later, learned the law, came to know how to organize union, and age of 15, I was a fully union organizer. And the bad thing, <laughs> In the age of 16, I was fired and blacklisted because I, I sued the factory owner and the government in our labor code as well as ILO Geneva because they have violated ILO Convention 87 in 98. Sue a government and factory owner in ILO Geneva in age 16, our government couldn't take that. Okay, they couldn't take it. And they started looking job in other factory, but they made my life miserable. They sent my bio and picture to every other factory and blacklisted me. It was so tough for me when I have a little brother and sister at home and with no jobs. Then I was one of the, I mean, lucky one that the union, they found some spark on me that I can be a union organizer. And they hired me, which I call troublemaker. Okay. They hired me as a troublemaker. And since then, I'm making trouble. <laughs> you know, whenever I have a meeting with the factory owner, I very proudly I tell them, you know, that was your wrong decision to fire me from that factory. I could make a problem to 1,500 workers. It's one factory. Now what I'm doing, and you cannot change it. You make me a troublemaker, and I would do that so. <laughs> so this was one part. And now I work an organization called Bangladesh Center for Workers Solidarity, and I'm the executive director of this center. And journey from a worker to be executive director, from Dhaka to Vancouver today, definitely it wasn't easy. It was so tough, so difficult. I had to went through so many things, along with many of my coworkers in back home. So before I go, what sort of problem I had to face, I should give a, you know, a picture how the workers look like today in Bangladesh, what they are facing, what is the problem, sir, and what is the other struggles. Still workers are working long shifting hours. It is 12 to 14 hours, it is common. And Law says the general hour would be eight hours, and then over time will be voluntary. But it's not voluntary. Workers are forced to do that, and in some cases, they, they do that. They're willing to do that, because the wage they make, it is so low. It is a poverty wage. $38 is for per month. There is a, a raise given just seven days back that was going to be a $68, but still it is a property wage. The workers was asking for $100 as a minimum. Without that, it would be so difficult for them to live with that money. Even it is more difficult if they have two kids in their family. But it is a country strategy to keep the wages low so they can attract the companies to come into the country and do the business. And how about the union rights? Just in the, gar in the garment industry, we have four million workers are working. This is the, you know, biggest industry in the country. Among these four million, 85% are female worker, or over 85%. They are so young. The average age range is 20 to 25 years. Whenever workers try to organize, 
As I have been fired, it is happening today. The workers getting threatened, beaten, fired, falsely by church, and sometimes also forced to leave the community because the community leaders align with the factory owners. It is so difficult for us to establish this union rights because of other, one other reason. 10% of our factory owners are in the parliament, in the National Assembly. So the other word is, my legislator is my factory owner. Where I would go? When I come this part of the world and talk to the people, consumers, legislator in US and everywhere to put pressure onto the Bangladeshi government to let free workers to exercise union, they tell me I'm a devil. They tell me I, I do a terrible job and I take that, that as a compliment. Just one week back, I was in New York City. I had a talk there in a public event where Bangladeshi government people show up. And before the meeting, they were telling me that you have to tell everything good, everything good. And I said, why I have to? No, you are, you are here, you are representing the country. You should tell everything is fine there. And I said, hey man, everyone has their own job. You do yours, I do mine. You fail to protect workers, but I will not fail to tell the world what you are doing. Yeah. How about the safety or safe working place look like? I think it is nothing to explain. When you hear Tazreen fire, where 112 workers died in a factory fire, and they died because the doors was locked. When you hear a building collapse with 5,000 workers and death toll is 1,134 and left 1,000 of them for lifetime injured. Just since 2005 to 2013, we lost over 2,000 workers in the factory fire and building collapses. You know our shameless factory owner and government what they say? After this disaster, they say, it's a wake up call. <laughs> it's a wake up call for them. The factory fire, it is nothing new. The first factory fire, the disaster was in 1990, where the factory called Sharaka caught fire, and it has killed 30 workers, including the factory owner, one of the owner, because the doors was locked. In those days, they say it is a wake-up call. That was in 1990. There was a building collapse in 2005. You know, the workers was lucky. It has collapsed overnight. So there was a, about 100 workers. Out of 100, six, 86 of them died. They said it's a wake up call. There was two other biggest, I mean many, many of them, but recent two other biggest fires was in 2010, which killed about 50 workers. Among two, they said wake up call. Still they are saying wake up call. When it will be extreme, for us, for our workers, it is more than extreme. We cannot take anymore. I cannot see there is a fire and going to the following morning in that factory, seeing a thousand of their siblings comes and crying and asking and telling that I didn't get my beloved body. Even today, I go to the factory area at the Rana Plaza, the family that comes with the picture, I didn't get my beloved yet. And they say it's a wake up call. It's not a wake up call. We are overwhelmed. 
I know every single one in this room, you are stunned with us. We know that, though I'm too far away. But always I tell my people, my worker, co-workers, every single workers I meet that, trust me, we are not alone. There is the other part of the world, the people, the consumers, the unionists, everyone care about us. Who don't care? Our factory owner, our government, and these companies. This company just wanted to happy their face by saying that their profit is spreadsheet. They, they never thought about these human faces who are the behind of level, making most profit for them and dying in the factories. And now, I'm here to say, enough. I know every one of us, every one of us, we all together, but it is for us to be outspoken to go to the Hudson Bay, to go to the Sears, to go to everyone, to tell them that enough is enough. We taken more than even we wanted to. Now it is your turn. Sign the accord, save this life. Don't show anything that doesn't help to the workers, that doesn't give workers to be on board, which is alliance. Alliance doesn't give any space to the workers to be in the board and say that, yes, this is how we feel our factory can be safe. And moreover, it is not binding. These corporation, these companies has their so-called code of conduct, CSR, everything has failed to save these workers' lives in the factories. So we don't want anything voluntary anymore. We want something that says it is legally binding and something that says, yes, we will work with union to make sure that the workers have a safe working place. And that is the reason we need these companies to pay, sign the accord. And also the companies like Loblo to pay the full and fair compensation to the workers at Rana Plaza, what they owe to them last seven months. I know everyone, every stakeholders have their obligation to do. The factory owners, they should, they should be abide by the law. They should implement all the law we have. The government, they should monitor, they should be oversight, and they should have a strong monitoring. But as I said, because of their relation, because of their political relation, they are one group. So until we get pressure from this part of the world, we cannot make change. It is not only the union, it is not only the company, the government of Canada also do a lot of things. Our country, our apparel industry, get a GSP facility, tax-free facility, to the US market. Why don't we go to the Canadian government and tell that the every single clothes that comes to the Canada has, I mean, comes to the Canada through any company, whatever the company it is, they have to sign the accord. Yeah. If, you, if, if you see the news, just yesterday, there was U.S. Marine. Their clothes we found at the rubble of Tajreen. When we brought into them, there was a lot of pressure back and forth. And just yesterday, U.S. Marine, they says they will not take any clothes from any company who didn't sign the accord. And now, our next goal is to have American military exchange. And I think on the first week of December, I'm going to talk at the Cap Capitol Hill that why it is important. And I hope that we will able to make understand the American 
military actions, why they need to sign on the accord not to be side of the alliance. Though there is a huge lobbying going on by the alliance people at the Capitol Hill not to have that bill passed. So all of us, I mean, I know very strong union people in this room we have today. Definitely we can go to the Canadian government and say, hey, you have to listen to us. We don't want it to see any workers' blood in our clothes, blood, sweat, and their tears. I just wanted to give a comparison about my working day and today. As I said, it was long working shift. There was a no union rights. When I was organizing, I've been fired. Even when I was in the factory in 1990, my factory got fired and I kept locked in the production floor along with many coworkers. And when we were crying, screaming, they didn't open the door. And late when we tried to break the, you know, the collapsible gate, after one and a half hour, they opened the door. But when we all was rushed to escape from the factory, many of my coworkers has been stampeded. So these three areas, there are many, but these three areas, the wages, union rights, and the safe working place, nothing have been changed. I know many of them, I, I could see your face when I said, I was making $6. But you know when workers are making 68, I mean, they're making 38, they're going to make $68 in next few days, is still, is a low wage than I was making because the inflation rate is so high. The house rent goes rise before workers get any minimum wage rise and there is no control on that. I was at, locked at the factory in, in two decades back and there was a workers locked at the factory just one year back at Tajreen. The fire started in the downstairs. Workers smelled the smoke. They screamed. They tried to escape, but the factory management, they forced them and told them to go back to the machine and keep working. When they saw fire, and they locked the door. When they saw the fire, they tried to escape, but they're running here and there. They couldn't. 69 bodies has been found in the one production floor and just over 12 of them just found right in front of the door which was been locked by the factory manager. And many workers, they jumped from the building. They removed the window bar, they removed the adjust fan bar, they jumped, many of them jumped to the death. So nothing has been changed in my working time and now in terms of safety area. And trade union rights, as I explained, I got fired and even workers today, they get fired, trade and beaten. And I, as I said that, I'm gonna tell my story about my journey to as a sewing machine helper to executive director, it is not easy. Being supporting workers' voice, we had to face a lot of problem. Many, many problems by the government and by the factory owners. It started in 2006, but it was extreme in 2010 when we were supporting workers' voice to give a raising of minimum wage. First, the government cracked down our organization. They revoked our registration, so we would not have any legal entity to operate but we didn't stop. We just keep doing our work. Then they brought 11 different criminal charges against us that we are the problem maker, troublemaker. We instigating the unrest across the industrial world. Are they crazy when the workers are saying that to give a rise of minimum wage, they're saying we are the instigator to making the unrest in the industrial world. I got arrested along with my coworkers. 
kept in a place which is dirty, two feet by four feet, seven days, and interrogated me 18 hours in a row, just to hear that, yes, I did vandalizing. But I didn't do that, why I should? Why I should say so? Then they kept me in the, in the prison for a month. My colleague who got arrested with me, he was severely beaten at the police custody. Then we release, we release on bail because there was a tremendous international pressure from, of course, many of you have sent a letter. There is a many, many letter has been sent by uh, US consumer union group as, as well as from Europe. 19 senator, from, senator and congressman from US uh, Senate, they sent a letter to the government. But still, we are facing three of these criminal charges. Don't think that that was the end. Just last year, one of my colleagues, my friend, one of the senior organizers of my center, Aminul Islam, he kidnapped and brutally tortured and beaten to death. Just because he was organizing workers to join union. Just because he was supporting workers' voice to raising the minimum wage. Just because he raised boys when workers was fired illegally from the factory and went to the company and says that you have to pay all the legal entertainments these workers. Is this our fault? Is this what we shouldn't do? And every evidence finger to the national security intelligence of Bangladeshi government. But nobody has been arrested yet. That can be happened to me too. That can be happened to my colleagues. That can be happen to my brother, who is a union organizer now these days. But we believe if we all work together, we can prevent it. We can have a decent voice, to, decent voice for workers. We can have a safe working place for workers. We can stop all harassment and intimidation against the union organizer and our workers can really have a union, a strong union at their workplaces. We have 5,000 factory across the country, and till today we have only 100 factory union registered. So it is a long way to go. But still, there is a hope. We can make change. If I can, you can too. So we want you. We want your support to hold this corporation responsible to sign the accord so we can have a safe working place. Also tell them to give fair so our workers can get a fair price. And also tell them, tell their vendors the factory owners to let our workers exercise union in their factories. Thank you.